I suppose, in my early 20s, um, when life being as it is gives you a few setbacks here and there. And I'd finished a, a trade and had a pretty good job, but I still felt this urge to do something more than what, what my pop and all the other people in the street had done, which was just, just exist, you know, just, just live their lives. I, I wanted to do something which was, which perhaps nobody else had ever done, and I wanted to contribute. As a small boy, Neville Coleman began to learn about the creatures that lived on the seashores of his native Australia. Now, this other world that lies beneath the water has become for him a total obsession and a source of never-ending adventure and wonder. I like beautiful things, and things under the water are probably the most beautiful. On land, we think that we've got, you know, flowers and trees and beautiful animals, but they're nothing compared to what there is underwater, because it's new and it's different. And to learn things underwater, we have to change our whole way of thinking and reteach our eyes to, to see. And it's, it's an awareness which is, which, which just doesn't come naturally. You have to put work into it. There's enough work in the oceans to keep Neville Coleman and his fellow naturalists busy for many years to come. Here in the world's last unknown, there are thousands of plants and animals yet to be identified, described, photographed and classified. And with the period for study limited by the air in their tanks, marine naturalists have hardly even begun to study animal behaviour in the deep. Who'd have thought that the dreaded moray eel, when he's treated as a friend, would behave like an amiable puppy instead of the fearsome attacker of men his reputation suggests? Earth's largest living space is provided by the oceans. They cover 71% of our planet's surface. The richest marine life is found close to land, where the sea is shallow. And it's on the Australian continental shelf that Neville Coleman explores and photographs the teeming marine creatures. Oh, I've got some beautiful pictures. Yeah! But boy, not, not half as many as I'd like to get. Of all that cliff face, can you imagine beautiful coloured trees all hanging off. Not one or two, but hundreds of them, and all different colours, all beautiful colours. And, and these things aren't this big. They're four and five foot high, and they're hanging off everywhere. I've never seen anything like it, really and truly. The fish species down there, there's got to be, I don't know, there's got to be 30, 35 species I've never, ever seen before, and at least 50 I've never photographed. And some I've only ever seen in books, and they're down there swimming. <laughs> And you can actually see him, you know. Neville Coleman's boundless enthusiasm for his underwater world has now provided him with a life's work. If his self-imposed task is ever completed, then single-handed he'll have photographed the entire marine fauna of the Australian continental shelf. This great collection of pictures he calls the Australasian Marine Photographic Index. Already, the index contains 30,000 transparencies all identified and cross-referenced. A traditional way of cataloguing marine creatures is to collect specimens and preserve them in glass jars. But only with a photograph can the true colour and form be preserved. Working on his index and on a dozen books, Neville has already made more than 10,000 dives and can recognise 6,000 species from memory. Unlike most of those who venture underwater, He's armed only with knowledge and love. Were you trained as a marine biologist at all? No, but I have had a lot of what I call formal training. You see, I've had 17 years in the biggest university in the world, the ocean. And uh, I've put a lot of time in, you know, over 10,000 dives I've had with my eyes open. I trained myself, I taught myself. I was a bit lazy at school. I was actually a... a I danced at school, they told me I would never amount to anything, but it was only because I hadn't had enough experience. I was a little bit behind, because my pop wasn't very well educated, so he couldn't teach me anything. And I didn't get on very well at school with teachers or the chill kids because of, of problems at home. And 
once I wanted to do something, I found a way in which I could teach myself. And everything I know, I've taught myself. Neville Coleman now makes his living from his writing and photography and by organizing underwater expeditions around the Australian coastline. But we joined him on the first day of his first visit to the waters that surround the islands of Papua New Guinea. Here, he'll explore a stretch of barrier reef just south of Port Moresby. The reef he's to visit has been developed as a marine park by local diver Bob Halstead. With comfortable diving temperatures and outstandingly good visibility, these coastal waters promise to be the most magnificent hunting ground for the marine naturalist. With the probability of encountering many species new to him, Neville carefully prepares the photographic equipment he himself has designed. This is a, uh, a close-up setup, whereby it just all you need to do is get a small animal in between these two little bars and pull the trigger, and you've got perfect pictures. And this is just really a, a recording tool. It's not actually a we don't do photographic art or anything with this particular. This is a recording for small nudibranchs, coral pops, and things that are very very small. And in this one here, we have a plastic housing yeah. with a Nikon in it yeah. and a sports finder and two electronic flashes yeah. which allows by fitting the distance on these which is like that you can take if you want to take really close ones you can take them down like like that so I can take an animal inch long or I can take them right out and take an animal a meter long yeah. so I can take plankton or my, right through the whales whatever I meet under there because there are so many unexpected things that you don't know and you, so if you just go down with this and you meet a, you know, an eight-foot tiger shark, you can hardly take a picture of it, can you? And you really want to get that picture. There are other distinguished photographers on board. Ron Taylor is our underwater cameraman and filmed Neville Coleman at work for this program. As the camera team that shot some of the shark scenes for Jaws and Blue Water White Death, Ron Taylor and his wife Val are thoroughly at home in tropical waters where sharks are a diver's frequent companion. A lot of people who take pictures and shoot film uh, under the water, particularly I'm thinking of the, the television people now, they tend to concentrate on the big, glamorous underwater creatures and probably the ones that, that frighten us a little bit, like sharks and rays. Right, and I definitely agree. And, you know, for years I've been a little bit, I suppose, critical of that fact because and now it's so much more difficult to sell straight natural history because people are conditioned to wanting people being chewed up by sharks. I mean, I could sell real lots of pictures if I could get, get pictures of sharks, you know, with one of my legs down their throat, I could be, make a lot of money. But when you're only working with the more placid creatures that are underwater, and some of the most spectacular and beautiful ones, like nudibranchs and, and maybe Gorgonian sea fans and, and fish, um, they may not be as spectacular. And I think television looks at things for being um, a lot of action and a lot of danger. And, you know, I don't consider, even though I go into the ocean by myself, that I'm in any danger. As luck would have it, when Neville dived with the tailors the following day, a large shark made an appearance and hung about long enough to distract even Neville Coleman from his beloved corals and mollusks. We were really fortunate because, according to Bob Halstead, he's never seen any good sharks out here at the, on the reef at all. And when we went in, uh, there was a silvertip red shark, which is a, a very maneuverable shark. Generally, these sharks come straight up out of the, uh, 200 foot of water, straight up over the reef edge and straight at you. So you have to get the photographs really quick. Well, I've never seen a, a silvertip reef shark in shallow water like that. It was only in 40 foot of water and so uh, switched on. He was really working. I mean, he wasn't aggressive in regard to that he wasn't, didn't, he wasn't making rushes with his mouth open, but his pectoral fins were down. His back wasn't hunched, but he came in very, very close on a dozen different occasions. You know, I mean, this fellow is, is, a, is a shark which can do damage had he wanted to. And it really pumped a nice little bit of adrenaline in and gave us a, an exciting little bit, you know, bit of time in the water. But is there nothing that you're afraid of underwater? Oh, uh, yeah, there'll probably be one main thing, other people. 
especially other people with, uh, that have got some sort of weapon which they're using to um, protect themselves. Because if they've got a weapon down there they're using to protect themselves, then they're psychologically... Um, I don't want to be in the water with them, because I have been in the water with them. I've actually been in Western Australia, had guys in the water protecting me that put me in far more danger than what I would have been from any of the animals that were there with loaded spear guns. I mean, it's just amazing, because they're scared. If anything happens, they'll pull the trigger first and ask questions later. And I don't want to be in front of the... I've seen what they did to fish. I don't like spears very much. But what about the conventional villains of the deep? I mean, what about sharks yep. and sea well, snakes and clowns? Right. And, yeah. No, I've done, I've done a lot of work underwater on, on the so-called dangerous marine animals in Australia. Um, I've probably had more experiments that I've done on myself on the stinging ones anyway than anybody else has and photographed the results. Um, but on the big things that most people keep most people out of the water and, and the things that kept me out of the water very, very early in the piece, uh, sharks and sea snakes. And sure, they are very potentially deadly animals. And if, but when you think about it, if you're down there and the sea snake comes along and you sit on him or kick him or knee, you're going to turn around and bite you the same as I would. I mean, really, that's about all that's in it. They don't eat people. They eat little fish and, and fish eggs. And as long, it's, again, it's knowledge. If you know and you're not scared of the sea snakes down there and, and you learn from somebody who's actually been down there and handled them and worked with them, then you can go down there with that same... It's not bravado, it's knowledge. That's the only thing. And it's, it's not that you're of any consequence bigger than anybody else or more braver. It's just that you know more than anybody, than other people do. And so therefore you're not scared because you know this animal's not going to attack you unless you do the wrong thing. I started out in my late teens to, to beat all those fears. And I've done pretty good at most of them. Because when you get backhanders as a kid for putting your hand out the side of the boat because the sharks will bite them off, I mean, you really get scared about going in the water because you really believe what the big people tell you. Those sharks are going to bite you as soon as you go in the water. Uh, the first three weeks I spent under the ocean, I spent round, swimming around in circles looking for the things that were going to eat me. But of course, when I survived after three weeks, you suddenly realise that all that's just in people's head and it's only fear that's talking. And if you can conquer your own, then... The whole world is there. worked hard and it was total dedication but then I don't do anything without total dedication I don't know any other way to do it not being brilliant the only thing I've ever won is because I persevered and kept going when other people gave up I had a purpose and that was that's the important thing if you can teach children and give them a purpose they will teach themselves that's the best kind of teaching not with not by fear and not by stick or not by threats but because they want to it's sort of like opening doors of knowledge and making people walk through. 
on their own bat. You can open them, but not very many walk through. You have to make it encouraging and enthusiastic and give them confidence in their own ability so they want to work through. You have to give them values and principles so that they can see a place for themselves in the world, whereas sometimes it doesn't always look like there is. And I use the ocean for my place. And it's worked out very, very well. Oh boy. That dive, there's more species down there than anywhere else I've ever seen in any area I've ever dived in my life. Have a look at this. <laughs> this is a, I'll take him out. It's a sea cucumber. But a beautiful, look at, color? look at the colour of that. Fabulous, isn't it? I've, I've recorded about 150 species of these in Australia. I've never seen this one before, ever. It's just, they're usually just nondescript colours and not very exciting, but this one's a really special one, isn't it? My biggest ambition was to find one new species. I thought, gee, if I can find one thing that no one's ever found, you know? And since that day that I wanted to do that, I found 150 new species of animals no one else has, that are undescribed in science. Have they named them after you? Not the 150. No, they don't like me that much. <laughs> I've had about nine, on it, been honoured by about nine different species of animals that have been named after me so far. This humble and once anonymous marine animal is now dignified with the name Pseudoceros culmini, Coleman's flatworm. Pterotyphus loe culmini, Coleman's typhus. Periclemenes culmini, Coleman's urchin shrimp. That's something you brought back. Oh, this is a... Uh... It's a nudibranch. This is a naked gill sea slug. A nudibranch means naked gill because you can actually see the gills outside of the body, whereas most organisms have their, gill, have their lungs inside. But they don't have any eyes like we have eyes. These are called rhinophores, right? And they detect chemical substances in the water, food. Uh, they don't have very many predators because they actually, they, they're a mollusk without a shell. Yeah. They don't have any shell because they've evolved a special substance, acidic substance, which they can squirt out when fish grab them and the fish spit them out again. So even if they take them in, but fish learn, you know, they're pretty smart too. They might, the juveniles may grab a nudibrank, and they, but they'll spit him out again because he doesn't taste nice. And if you don't believe me, you can taste him. <laughs> you have never tasted Yes, I have, yeah, sure. I didn't believe too many people. You're crazy. I mean, I'm crazy, yeah. <laughs> but I mean, you learn. Did you cook it first? No, you just put it in your mouth, you can just taste it's really acidic, you know? Oh, I know you're crazy. No, no, that it, otherwise, if there's no one to teach you about the things in the ocean. Unless you go learn yourself, and you take the, the chance of finding out whether all these things are... How the hell are you going to teach anybody else what's real? Mm. You know, we're going to be back in the dark ages like we've been for the last 50 years, not going to go in the water because there's something in there going to eat us. What did it taste like? It's lousy. You know, it really is horrible. When you've finished seeking, when you've finished, there's nothing else in the world for you to see and you retire and sit in a little, your, you get your retirement fund and you sit there and vegetate till you die. That's what I'm talking about. It doesn't have to be, you know, anybody can do anything as long as they believe in it. Everything in the ocean is, I'm part of it. It's part of me. I can't just cut it off and, and put it over here and, and, and talk about it in five minutes or 10 minutes time. It's what I live for, it's my life. Anybody that lives with me or around me has to accept that fact. What is your ambition? What do you want to do now? You've achieved a tremendous lot. Um... Yes. Well, I think probably what I set out to do was record the entire marine fauna of Australasia underwater. And sure, it might be, in some people's eyes, an impossible task. But what the hell? Why set yourself a task you can conquer? Every morning I get out of bed. I know there is so much work waiting for me, I couldn't possibly achieve it. But it gives me a... It gives you that you never get bored. You never get, you know... You just know that that's all there to do. And you're the one that's doing it. And there's not very many other people in the whole world doing what you're doing. And it's exciting because what you're seeing is new. You're 
an adventurer and an explorer in a world where very few people bother to go. And what you're seeing with your eyes are things people, other people have never seen before, or only very few. And that's pretty, pretty good stuff to live on, I tell you that. Thank <laughs> you.